Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever the case may be. Welcome to Manitowoc Ice November webcast. This is a global webcast. That's why I started out that way. Uh, we're going to be covering the Quiet Cube uh, ice machines today, the sequence of operation, and uh, remote troubleshooting. Uh, so uh, we'd like to welcome everybody here. My name is Jared Glines. I'm a Territory Service Manager here at Manitowoc Ice Machines, and uh, I'll be uh, your, your host today as we go through the uh, Quiet Cube uh, November webcast. So again, welcome. Let's get started. Uh, during the course of the, the webcast today, we've muted everybody so that we don't get any back feed or, or anything like that. So uh, if you do have questions, we will be able to answer questions. And so we'll utilize the chat feature in the webcast for those questions. The chat feature is going to be uh, located somewhere on your screen, hopefully. Uh, if you're on your smartphone, it might be a little bit harder to find, but uh, you should see either a question mark there might be a balloon with a couple little lines in it as well. That's going to open up the show conversation. And uh, feel free to ask any questions during the course of the webcast today that might come up. Maybe I didn't clear something uh, or wasn't clear enough on something or uh, you didn't exactly understand what I meant. Uh, go ahead and pop that question in there. We do have people standing by uh, help, to help us today. I'd like to also welcome Will York. He's the producer. He'll be uh, joining us today and he'll be uh, handling a majority of those questions coming through uh, in that chat feature as we go forward. So that's how we'll utilize uh, the chat feature to answer questions. At the end of the webcast today, there's going to be not only a link in the chat uh, or conversation area, but we'll also put a QR code up on the screen. Uh, we're going to invite you to take a quiz. This quiz is going to go through and ask a few questions. We'll have um, uh, some some questions to answer uh, at the end of taking the quiz. You'll go ahead and give us your email address. And for a reward for getting that quiz in there, you're going to receive a, not only a, a certificate of training for attending the, the webcast, you'll also get a copy of today's presentation in a PDF format. So all of the slides that we'll go through today, you'll get those uh, in a PDF. Uh, so that you can go back and review them if necessary as you're going through these um, um, the information or if you, you get uh, a little bit stuck somewhere, maybe out in the field as you're working on a piece of equipment. So there's no right or wrong answers. It's not pass or fail. You can go in and answer them all wrong. Uh, you're still going to get a certificate and a copy of today's presentation, but we'd really like you to, to make a good attempt at that quiz. We need to understand uh, if if we're doing a good enough job and getting this information out to you. So please uh, take a few minutes, fill out uh, the quiz, submit that uh, with your email address and send it to us. And again, we'll give you not only the virtual seminar, but a PDF of today's presentation. So again, the, the uh, November webcast, we're gonna be covering Indigo Next Quiet Cube ice machines. We'll go through the sequence of operation. We won't spend a lot of time there, but we'll go through the sequence of operation and we'll cover troubleshooting for the um, uh, Quiet Cube ice machines that we have on the sequence of operation in the Quiet Cube or CVD. Uh, what Jan what uh, where did the term Quiet Cube come from? All right, so that's that's a term of endearment that marketing came up with. On the Quiet Cube ice machines, the ice making is taking place in the head of this machine. Uh, with the evaporator and the control circuits, but we've taken all the noise and heat generating portions of this machine and put it out to our remote CVD uh, condensing unit. So the compressor, the condenser, the condenser fan motor are all out and away from that piece of equipment from where the ice is being made. Uh, we've got quiet cubes that can produce up to 2,000 pounds of ice every single day, and you could walk past that machine and not even hear it running because the compressor and all that stuff's outside. And so that's where the term quiet cube came in. As far as the sequence of operation goes, we'll go ahead and start with the uh, Indigo Next quiet cube CVD. The, 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 there's going to be an equalization. We'll also start with a water pump. Also, we want to point out that a recent firmware change took us to a five minute delay prior to a restart off of a full bin. You can see there on, on the slide that that's at 9.2. That's the current revision that we have out on our website right now. Uh, before 9.2, if you have a number lower than that, it's actually a three minute delay prior to a restart that kind of matches the air water remotes 
we added a five minute delay and that's a lot for uh, the next bullet point below that, the delay on break timer. We've got a five minute delay on break timer. We will talk more about that coming up here shortly, but uh, we wanted to match the full bin shutdown from the control board to our delay on break uh, mechanical timer located out in that condensing unit for the contactor in the quiet cube. So we'll always start our machines up in a purge cycle. There'll be a 45 second purge water pump and dump valve are energized. We'll equalize the refrigeration system by energizing the harvest valves. Uh, we're gonna utilize a liquid line solenoid valve and a low pressure switch in this unit. So this is going to be a true pump down system. Uh, those of you familiar with the old Indigo Quiet Cubes, we did eliminate the low voltage communication cable. We're gonna go back to the way it was before with just a simple low pressure switch and liquid line solenoid valve to help us energize and de-energize uh, the condensing unit located out and away from where the ice is being made. We'll go into a pre-chill. The initial pre-chill will be 120 seconds. Subsequent pre-chills will be 30 seconds. The free cycle officially will begin when the water pump kicks on. If we start running water across the evaporator during that free cycle, we'll stay in that free cycle, clear up until the point where the ice thickness probe makes contact with uh, the ice to initiate the harvest cycle. We do have some maximum allowable times uh, for the freeze cycle. The most amount of time we'll keep this machine in freeze is 35 minutes. Uh, if the ice probe has not made contact with that sheet of ice within 35 minutes, uh, the uh, machine will initiate a harvest cycle based on time if, the, uh, if it didn't make contact with the ice probe. As we go into harvest, we'll get rid of whatever leftover water we have, which won't be a lot. Uh, we're going to get that down the drain. It is considered mineral-laden water, so we'll get as much of that down the drain as we can. We'll stay in the harvest cycle, energizing the harvest valves, uh, allowing the evaporator grids to warm up so that the ice can release and fall down to the bin. During the harvest cycle, if the curtain switch or the damper doors open and close within 30 seconds, the machine goes back to pre-chill. If it's open for more than 30 seconds, we will shut down on an automatic shutoff and again, just recently with 9.2 firmware, it's going to be a five-minute delay now rather than a three-minute delay. Liquid line solenoid valve closes. The symptom, this, um, refrigeration system will pump down. The low pressure switch will open, and uh, it will go ahead and de-energize the condensing unit. We will have a fan cycle switch out there in that uh, remote condensing unit, and uh, we'll also utilize a head pressure control valve. Uh, on the R404 refrigeration systems, we have a 12 PSI open or cut out on that low pressure switch. On the R410 refrigeration systems, that's going to be a 20 PSI open or cut out on that low pressure switch, at which point the contactor will de-energize. And again, there will be that delay on break timer located out in that condensing unit. Once the five minute delay is expired and the curtain switches are allowed to close, we'll start back up at the very beginning. On the IB or ice beverage units, we do have a built-in bin probe. They come automatically with them. These machines are intended for use on a beverage system, on a dispenser. Uh, so we don't want to overfill. This uh, bin probe will come on that machine already. However, it will be in a horizontal position for shipping. That allows us to be able to let that machine sit on the bottom of the box on, on the pallet. And so when we go to install that, <coughs> ice beverage unit, we definitely want to take the thumb screw out and rotate that uh, bin probe down so that it can serve its purpose and prevent overfilling of those dispensers in that machine. And again, going back to the five minute delay on break timer, we have a mechanical timer built in to that uh, condensing unit outdoors. Once that low pressure switch opens, it will open that circuit to that uh, five minute delay on break timer. And even if the low pressure switch closes, then until that five minutes has expired, the uh, contactor coil will not re-energize. So that's why we, we went to the five minute delay through the control circuit to match the five minute delay we had on our, our delay on break timer. So going over the timers, the, the limits on the control board, we do have a 35 minute maximum freeze cycle. We have a seven minute maximum harvest cycle. Uh, including a water assist if needed. Uh, we still anticipate a majority of these machines will harvest within the first three and a half minutes. 
However, if we don't see the uh, dampers activate within that first three and a half minutes, the control board will fill up the water trough, kick on the water pump 30 seconds later, and try to use some water to help us release that ice in the event that we're having trouble getting the ice off the evaporator grid. Uh, and so we also have some um, timers in regards to the water inlet valve. The control board is only going to keep the water inlet valve energized a maximum of six minutes on a single evaporator and a maximum of eight minutes on the larger dual evaporator quiet cube machines. Also, the control board limits are if you fill up and satisfy your high water level probe twice within the first six or eight minutes, depending on which machine you have. That's it. That's all the water you're going to get. You have enough water to make a full sheet of ice. So we're, we're going to have one of those two limits controlling that water circuit. So I know I went through the sequence of operation a little bit quickly. We wanted to spend a little bit more time talking about the refrigeration theory on the quiet cube ice machines. It's a lot different than what we utilize on our air, water, and traditional remote machines. If you want a more detailed uh, description of the sequence of operation, uh, I'll tell you a way to get that towards the end of the, the webinar today uh, at our website. We do have additional resources available for you on our, our website for sequence of operation, preventative maintenance, things like that. So let's get into the uh, quiet cube refrigeration system. We wanted, to, again, to spend a little bit more time on the refrigeration system today because it is so different um, from uh, our air water traditional remote. So in a nutshell, our self-contained air and water cooled units and the traditional remote machines all have the compressors located in the head of the units. And as a result, we'll utilize a sensible heat or a hot gas defrost on those machines. Because the quiet cubes, the compressors are outdoors. Maybe they're outdoors in the middle of January in Wisconsin where it's really freaking cold. It's down maybe in single digits or even in negative um, digit temperatures. We could no longer rely on that sensible heat. So we went to a latent heat defrost. That's where the term CVD for our remote condensing unit comes in. That stands for cool vapor defrost. So there's still a lot of heat left over in our refrigerant, uh, even though we may not have a ton of heat left on our compressor discharge line in that uh, latent heat of our refrigerant. So let's start out with the free cycle. Uh, again, our compressor is outdoors. We've got our suction line and a liquid line at the installation. So this will be a suction and liquid line installation. Uh, we're going to start out at the compressor. So at the compressor, we have a low temperature, low pressure vapor coming in off of the suction line. The compressor compresses it. That creates a high temperature, high pressure vapor, leaving the compressor on the discharge line. We're going to go out into the condenser where we need to give up our sensible heat and our latent heat of refrigerant to condense from that vapor to a liquid. Because this condensing unit could potentially be located outdoors in a very cold ambient, we will utilize a head pressure control valve or more commonly known as a headmaster uh, for those low ambients. And we'll talk about how that functions in those low ambients coming up. We're going to then send the liquid from that condenser back down through the liquid line, through our service valve and into our receiver. On the Indigo Next Quiet Cubes, we're still going to monitor those four temperatures with thermistors. Because our thermistor wires are nowhere near long enough and we're no longer relying on discharge line temperature, we're not going to be monitoring discharge line temperature on the quiet cubes. We'll monitor the liquid line temperature with thermistor number one as that liquid comes back from the condensing unit. That liquid will go into the receiver and as that liquid leaves the receiver, we'll monitor liquid line temperature with thermistor number two of that liquid leaving the receiver. So the thermistor one is the liquid entering the receiver. Thermistor two is the liquid temperature leaving the receiver. We'll go through our liquid line dryer, through our liquid line solenoid valve. As we learned earlier, this is a pump down system. We will utilize that liquid line solenoid valve to turn off the condensing unit by de-energizing and allowing that uh, system to pump down outdoors. Go through a heat exchanger to gain some efficiency. We'll continue to utilize a thermostatic expansion valve to meter that liquid out into our evaporator. As we meter that liquid through the expansion valve into our evaporator, it's going to cause the refrigerant to change state again. It's going to go from a liquid back to a vapor. 
And this is where our refrigerant works its magic. As we go from a liquid to a vapor, our refrigerant begins absorbing heat. And it's going to absorb heat from our load, which in our case is water. So we're going to start absorbing that heat from our water in that refrigerant as we go from a liquid to a vapor. We'll carry that heat in the suction line back out into that suction line back to the condensing unit on a single evaporator machine. We'll monitor the inlet and the outlet of the evaporator with thermistors three and four on a, a larger dual evaporator machine. We'll monitor both outlets, one outlet on each of those circuits. So we do have a few units that have multiple evaporators or single evaporators with multiple circuits. And we'll cover those again coming up here briefly. So on, on multiple circuit machines, we'll use thermistors three and four on the outlets of those refrigeration circuits. So we absorb heat from our water. We've got it in our suction, our low temperature, low pressure vapor. We're going to carry that heat back through that suction line, back out to the condensing unit. Also note, if you have a rise, if that condensing unit is more than 20 feet above this head unit where the ice is being made, you will need to install an S-trap in that suction line as close to the midway point as possible. So our maximum allowable rise is 35 feet. The condensing unit cannot be more than 35 feet above that head unit. But if you're more than 20 feet and, and not more than 35 feet, let's say just for argument's sake, you're at 28 feet. So we don't want you to put that S-trap as close to the midway point as possible. So with a 28 foot rise, we'd love to see that S-trap as close to that 14 foot mark as possible. We will have a suction filter. Please note, it is a suction filter. It does look like a dryer. There is no drying compound in it. It's just a series of screens. All it's doing is protecting the orifice in our accumulator, which we also have an accumulator in here. And we're gonna utilize and use this accumulator mostly during the harvest cycle. So that's gonna happen during the freeze cycle. Again, we do have an orifice. It's gonna help us return the oil. The same reason we have an S-trap in the suction line. We need to get that oil return through that refrigeration system. With the accumulator, we have a J-tube here. As that vapor passes through that J-tube and past that orifice, it'll create a little bit of a venturi effect where it'll draw that oil into the system so we can continue to um, get that oil circulating, that refrigeration oil throughout the system so we can keep all of our refrigeration components properly lubricated. Told you we'd get back to the head pressure control valve. So the head pressure control valve uh, in this machine on the quiet cube ice machines, our head masters or head pressure control valves actually have two jobs. On our traditional remote machines, our head masters only have one job, but on the, on the quiet cube machines, it has uh, two jobs. Its first job is to maintain a certain amount of head pressure in a low ambient condition. Inside this head pressure control valve out in that condensing unit, we have a nitrogen charge in that dome. It's not the same for all models. So uh, you may need to check your technician's handbooks. You may need to just look on the headmaster itself. We'll stamp what that nitrogen charge is on that headmaster. It can be anywhere from 220 to 260, depending on your model. Uh, and so it's not the same, but that nitrogen charge in here uh, is going to maintain a certain amount of pressure. It's an inert gas and it won't react to temperature uh, like uh, refrigerant will. So uh, the bypass or non-bypass is typically determined by ambient temperature out and around that condensing unit and 70 degrees Fahrenheit is that magic number. At 70 degrees Fahrenheit or above, that's considered a high ambient or a warmer ambient. And typically at that ambient temperature, the head pressure within the refrigeration system while that unit is running is going to be at or above what our nitrogen charge is in that headmaster. So essentially during the freeze cycle at 70 degrees and above out by that condensing unit, the headmaster is just sitting there quietly doing nothing because the head pressure in the system is overcoming the nitrogen charge within that uh, headmaster. However, as that air temperature starts to drop below 70 degrees, we start gaining a lot of efficiency in the refrigeration system. We start removing a lot more heat as we remove heat from that refrigeration system. Then our head pressure starts to drop. And as our head pressure drops, now our nitrogen charge will be able to overcome the head pressure within our system, at which point it'll open up this little valve and start adding discharge gas right from the compressor 
uh, right into the liquid line. We'll start adding temperature from the compressor back into the liquid line to bring that head pressure up. And the reason why we do this is remember, we in these uh, ice machines, we don't just have to make ice. Once the ice is made, we have to be able to harvest. And so there has to be a certain amount of heat within that refrigeration system in order for us to harvest the ice properly in these machines. So uh, a headmaster was the only way we could guarantee we'd have enough heat left over in that system at the end of the freeze cycle so that we could properly harvest the evaporator from that or the ice from our evaporator down in our head section. So as those lower ambient temperatures occur, the headmaster will then modulate and maintain whatever pressure this charge is and, and maintain that warm calm of, all, of liquid at all times down to our receiver during the freeze cycle. As we go into the harvest, our harvest valve is going to energize down here in the condensing unit and as soon as or the head unit as soon as that harvest valve energizes we're going to see the suction pressure come way up and we're going to see the head pressure drop weight way down which brings us back to our second function of our headmaster in the harvest cycle as we go into harvest the headmaster's second job is to go into 100 percent bypass why? Because we need all the heat we can muster from this condensing unit. There may not be a lot in the middle of winter in Wisconsin, but the heat we do have on this compressor, we need it down here at our receiver. We need to warm up our receiver. For those of you attending the webcast today that do refrigeration, you know how this works. If you grab a cold jug of refrigerant out of your service truck and you go and hook up all your gauges and try to charge a piece of equipment, you're going to have a really tough time coaxing that refrigerant out of the jug and into the piece of equipment that you're charging. So typically what we'll do is we'll grab a, a five gallon bucket or go to the three compartment sink, fill it up with hot water and put that jug of refrigerant into that hot water to warm up that refrigerant. Once we've warmed up that refrigerant, it is going to increase the pressure within our cylinder. And now we can take it over there and uh, charge up that piece of equipment properly because our refrigerant is warmer. That's exactly what we're doing right here with the headmaster going into 100% bypass. By sending whatever heat we have through that headmaster, going to 100% bypass, send whatever heat we've got down through the liquid line to the receiver, we're warming up our jug of refrigerant. We're trying to build up the pressure in that receiver so that we can take the vapor off the top of that compressor and send it over into the evaporator where now our sensible heat is being used in the receiver in the evaporator during harvest, we're going to utilize our latent heat of refrigerant. Our latent heat of refrigerant is the heat left over that we can't measure or feel, but it's in that refrigerant. And as we give up that latent heat of refrigerant, we'll start warming up that evaporator so we can melt the bond between the evaporator and the uh, um, ice so that it can release. But wait a second. What happens when we give up the latent heat in our refrigerant? Well, our refrigerant condenses. It changes state. It goes from a vapor to a liquid. So yes, on the quiet cube ice machines, we will be sending a column of liquid back out to the condensing unit during harvest cycle because we'll utilize that evaporator kind of like a condenser to give up that heat in the evaporator during the harvest. And that's why we have to have that accumulator out there. We're purposely sending a column of liquid back out to the condensing unit during the harvest cycle in order to uh, harvest the ice on this machine. So keep that in mind. And that's why it's a lot different than uh, the air water. We're not using a sensible heat defrost. We're using a latent heat defrost. All right, so immediately following the harvest cycle, we've just loaded up a whole bunch of liquid of uh, refrigerant into our accumulator. And we need to get that refrigerant back out into the system. So our orifice in our accumulator that helps us with our oil return is also gonna help us clear this accumulator of that liquid refrigerant. It'll act a little bit as a metering device and we'll start metering it, that liquid back out in through that J tube as that the vapor goes past, it'll start drawing that liquid out in and it'll start boiling off as we get um, that accumulator clear of the liquid immediately following a harvest. As a result, uh, this is considered normal 
in a quiet cube ice machine immediately following the harvest. It's going to cause a sub-freezing vapor as it leaves that uh, accumulator because we're drawing a little bit of liquid through that orifice into that suction line, that low temperature, low pressure vapor. It's going to boil off really quickly and it's going to act as a metering device and we would expect to see ice on the evapor or on the accumulator and a lot of times even on the compressor itself. Uh, this is perfectly normal immediately following that harvest uh, as we clear that accumulator of the liquid refrigerant that we used in order to harvest the ice down in the head of that machine. So how do we determine if the head pressure control valve or headmaster is doing both of its jobs? Well, we're going to we're going to test it the same way we do on the uh, traditional remote machines. It's going to maintain that warm column of liquid at all times in a temperature below 70 degrees. But how do we know for sure the headmaster in the quiet cube machine is doing its second job going into that full 100 percent bypass? So in order to verify to make sure that the head pressure control valve is in 100 percent bypass, when you're out at the condensing unit where the headmaster is located, you're going to hear the tone change. You'll hear it. You'll know when that machine goes into the harvest cycle. Also, as the head pressure drops and the suction pressure comes up, the fan cycle switch is going to shut down. So you'll know you're in harvest. So wait about 30 seconds. 30 seconds into the harvest, you're going to grab the discharge line going into the headmaster and the liquid line coming out of the headmaster with your hands. I don't care what temperature they are. I just want to know if you feel a difference. The temperature is irrelevant. I just want to know if you feel a difference. If the liquid line is noticeably cooler than the discharge line going in, that headmaster is not in 100% bypass. Those two should feel pretty much the same uh, to your hands uh, 30 seconds into the harvest cycle. So that's how we can verify to see whether or not the head pressure control valve is really doing its job in the harvest cycle, especially if we're having harvest problems on this machine. We may be making ice really good, but struggling to get the ice off the evaporator grid. This may be one of the tests we need to do to identify and correct the problem in regards to that. So the other thing that uh, on the accumulator is we clear that accumulator uh, uh, following the, the harvest cycle as we go into the next freeze cycle. Uh, again, we'll get that uh, refrigerant out. After about five minutes, we would expect the accumulator to be cleared out and the frost and stuff would go away. There's times, there's there's months up here in Wisconsin that it never gets above uh, freezing. Uh, and so the ice on the bottom of that accumulator, it, it, once it forms uh, at the beginning of December, it may not go away until March up here. It, it gets pretty cold. So uh, it, it just a little bit of ice on the bottom all winter long sometimes on these quiet cube ice machines. It never gets warm enough here to, uh, uh, to melt that off. On a single circuit, a single uh, expansion valve circuit on these machines, the uh, normal fill pattern, we'd expect to see good ice formation all the way top to bottom on the evaporator grid. If we're a little bit, if we're starving that evaporator a little bit, uh, we'll see a little bit of a thin uh, for ice formation on the uh, outlet of the evaporator. That would indicate that we're not feeding enough refrigerant into the evaporator. Uh, if we're seeing poor ice formation on the inlet, maybe we're flooding uh, the evaporator a little bit. We've got too much liquid here before it can start boiling it off. That would indicate potentially a flooding expansion valve or maybe even a harvest valve that's uh, not open all the way. So We'll kind of go back to that as we get into more troubleshooting. And of course, if you've got no ice formation at all, that, that's that's definitely going to be a problem uh, on that evaporator, especially if you're in the freeze cycle. Uh, as I pointed out earlier or mentioned, I, I, didn't, I guess I didn't really point it out. We do have some dual evaporator, uh, um, I'm sorry, dual circuit single evaporators. Uh, it's an upper and a lower. The ice beverage unit is set up this way. Some of our air and water uh, and remote units are also set up the, this way, but the ice beverage units do have two expansion valves, two harvest valves. This came about uh, over the last several years. Uh, you guys have noticed that we've made a lot of changes uh, to our machines. We've renamed them Indigo Next from Indigo. We've also seen new refrigerants come into play with R410A. R404A in some models, R410A in others. Uh, and the reason why all of this occurred was 
Uh, we were we were following the guidelines set up by Energy Star. There was a three tier program that started clear back, believe it or not, in 2004. And it was a stepped program. And as we were, went further and further along, we had to get more and more energy efficiency. And then in 2018, the Department of Energy stepped in and even put in more stringent, a little bit more stringent rules than even Energy Star had come out with. And so Indigo Next is actually our answer to the DOE, the 2018 Department of Energy requirements. And that's why we decided to change model numbers at that time from Indigo to Indigo Next. That's the indication this is our 2018 DOE compliant machine. So one of the ways that we gained energy efficiency, again, a majority of what you've seen over the past uh, almost 20 years now have been in relation to these energy requirements. And one of the things my refrigeration engineering team figured out was if they took that whole refrigeration system and made two smaller circuits, uh, two expansion valves, two harvest valves, they were able to gain additional energy efficiency by doing that. So again, the ice beverage units, the ones that are designed for use on beverage to systems, these are set up with an upper and lower circuit with an inlet and outlet for each circuit and their own harvest valves. Uh, we'll also have air pumps in there. Those air pumps started back in 2004 with the S model because that was the first tier of Energy Star to help us gain energy efficiency by helping us break the vacuum on the evaporator uh, to help speed up the harvest cycle a little bit, not to blow the ice off of there, just to help break that vacuum to speed up that harvest cycle to gain that energy efficiency. But now with these dual expansion valve circuits, we could potentially see some weird ice formations that we're not accustomed to seeing in a Manitowoc ice machine. We could see, actually see poor ice formation somewhere in the middle of the evaporator on the bottom or, or other spots. And so a lot of times what you can do is just take the side panel off, take a glance, see where the expansion valve is located, see where the outlet to that expansion valve and the sensing bulb are located to tell you whether or not you might be starving or flooding that uh, portion of the evaporator grid. However, if you see ice formation similar to this, uh, it's pretty rare. Uh, I didn't say impossible, but it's pretty rare or, or pretty unlikely. The two expansion valves or two harvest valves will fail the same way at the same time. If you're seeing both refrigeration circuits being affected, typically, for the most part, this is going to be something I should be concentrating on the entire refrigeration system, maybe not just the expansion valves or harvest valves. Again, it's possible, just not very likely. So this would be something we'd probably concentrate more on the entire system, not each individual circuit if we saw that. So that's how we're going to utilize that refrigeration system in the free cycle and in the um, harvest cycle. It's a little bit different than we do with our sensible heat or hot gas defrost uh, with this uh, latent heat defrost on these quiet cube ice machines. The free cycles will be very similar, but the harvest cycles where things really change up. And as a result, we troubleshoot the harvest cycles on these machines a lot differently than we do on our air, water, and moats. So how do we troubleshoot the quiet cube ice machines? Well, in an effort to remain consistent, we've stick, stuck with our four symptoms of troubleshooting. Back in 2004, when we released our S model, we also released are troubleshooting by symptom. Look, we get it. Ice machines are kind of their own little animal. They're not like a lot of other pieces of equipment that we work on on a daily basis. Yeah, the free cycle maybe, but the harvest cycle is where it really trips people up. And I've seen a harvest cycle on an ice machine just kick the butt of a, of a service technician, a really good refrigeration technician who just was not used to working on ice machines. And so, Maybe the issue is electrical, maybe it's refrigeration, maybe it's something else. So we went to our four symptoms of troubleshooting to help simplify it and help keep the technicians focused in front of that piece of equipment. Because let's face it, there's a lot going on inside an ice machine. It's easy to get distracted by all the things going on in there. We've got water, we've got refrigeration, we've got electrical. There's a lot going on. It's really easy to get distracted by all that. And so this 
the troubleshooting by symptom helps keep us focused at the task at hand. So uh, symptom number one, uh, this would be a situation where the machine stops running, it won't run and or has a history of shutting down. Hey, service company, can you come look at my machine? I came in the other day, it was off, I had to turn it back on. Uh, I came in this morning again, and I had to turn it back on again. I keep shutting itself off. Can you come and figure out what's going on? Well, that would be symptom number one. That's a history of shutting down. Symptom number two, maybe the machine has a long freeze cycle. Maybe there's poor ice formation somewhere on the evaporator grid, or this could even be a low or slow ice production call. Hey, service company, can you come look at my ice machine? When I first got it, it kept up with me just fine, but now I'm starting to run out of ice and, and, and it just doesn't seem like it's doing as well as it did when I first got the machine. That would be symptom number two. That would be considered a low or slow ice production call. Symptom number three, machines making a great sheet of ice, but it's having trouble harvesting. This would be also a low production, but you would come across this noticing that, hey, when I go into the harvest cycle, that ice does not seem to be coming off the evaporator very well. Remember when we kind of quit, went through the sequence of operation really quickly? Most of these machines are going to harvest within a minute to two minutes, uh, three and a half minutes max. So if we're seeing longer than that, we may have to get in there, open up the machine, grab a hold of that sheet of ice and pull it off by hand. Once we do that, we're going to flip it around and look at the cubes where they were formed on the evaporator grid. How do they look? Do they have nice sharp edges? Do they have good clean corners? Or are they in the same shape as the evaporator grid? If you say, yeah, they do. They look exactly the same as the grid. Consider those cubes not melted out after we have tempted harvest. Symptom number four is almost the same thing. It's a normal freeze cycle, a long harvest cycle, but when we flip that sheet of ice around and look at the cubes, they're jagged, they're rounded, they're not much in shape of the evaporator grid, at which point, okay, this is a harvest problem, but we're melting the cubes out at the end of the harvest cycle. Along with our troubleshooting by symptom, we also first introduced our flow charts, our symptom flow charts. These have been around since 2004, and we've carried these flow charts through uh, Indigo, Indigo Next. They're still there. They're still available in technicians' handbooks. They're simple. Uh, read the question, answer yes or no based upon what you've identified, and then go in the direction it tells you. So is your display energized and functioning? If not, okay, let's look at the control board. Let's go here. And then eventually, if you have to get to it, it'll ask you if the machine's plugged in, if the display is not even energized and functioning. So if you say it is, okay, let's go look at this. And so based on how you answer the questions, whatever symptom or whichever situation you have while you're at that machine, eventually as you answer those questions, it's going to get to the point where it says, hey, this is what you need to do to fix it, or hey, this is the area or the component we need to troubleshoot to find out why this is occurring. They work that easy. So if you uh, have a technician's handbook, utilizing these flow charts helps keep you at the task at hand and not let all those other distracting things that are going on inside that machine uh, prevent you from focusing on what you're trying to identify in that piece of equipment in order to uh, correct the problem. Also on your magnetic bin switch, the curtain switch, remember, it's the one that the control board's looking for to terminate the harvest and shut the machine off on full bin. Since we're on symptom number one, if the machine won't run, the good news is Indigo Next will tell you, hey, curtain's off or full bin or something along those lines. Maybe a good indication we should be looking potentially at the curtain switch or something along those lines. So we can ohm it out. We can also go into the service menu of the Indigo Next control board in the data portion on the real-time data and in the inputs and see what the control board sees from that curtain switch. And it'll tell you on a single evaporator, we'll only use curtain switch one. And the control board's gonna say, hey, it's either closed or I, I see it closed or I don't see it closed or it's open. If you have the dual evaporators, which we're talking about, some of these quad cubes or dual evaporator machines, we'll use both curtain switches. If you've only got one evaporator, curtain switch two will be ignored by that machine. So we can go into that real-time data to see what the control board sees in regards to that curtain switch. If it doesn't see it, we can jump out directly from where that bin switch or curtain switch plugs into the board right to ground. Does the control board recognize it now? 
If you've got a jumper on the, uh, the connector on the control board from the board on the bin switch to ground and the control board still says, yeah, I still don't see that close, you're going to need a control board in there that would see that close. You would want to replace the board in that time. If it does say, yep, okay, I see it close now, then let's go look at the curtain switch. Let's make sure the magnets are still in uh, our dampers or our water curtains. It's a magnetic reed switch as these magnets line up to those reed switches. It's going to allow that curtain switch to open and close, telling the control board when to shut off on full bin or when to terminate harvest and go back into another cycle. On the dual evaporator machines, this is starting to get older. Uh, a few years ago, we did see a lot of issues where uh, these edges were a little too sharp on our dampers and they were causing restriction. They were hanging up on the bottom of the evaporator. Uh, the field fix was you could just kind of round it out with a little bit of a file or, or a Dremel or something like that. Just make it a little bit more of a rounder uh, area so it wouldn't drag and hang up on the sides of the evaporator grid. Uh, those corrective actions have been in place now for a few years, so it's, we're starting to see it go down. But uh, typically, the the uh, complaint would be if you're a service technician, you're getting called by the customer. The complaint would say, uh, "Hey, you know what? Uh, my machine it runs, and then it's off on full bin a lot, but it's really not off on full bin. Maybe you get there and you see it's off on full bin, and you get up there and you start to take the screws out to open up the front panel. And just as you're lifting that front panel off." The machine starts, you hear it start, and they're like, oh, crud. If you have that and you've got the dampers, concentrate on those dampers. Maybe the, just the, the you loosening up and taking off that front door was enough to get those to break loose and close so that the machine could restart. So if you get that symptom, uh, definitely kind of concentrate and make sure that you, those uh, dampers are allowed to move freely there in the um, on the bottom of those evaporators. Uh, symptom number two. Uh, a long freeze cycle, poor ice formation on the evaporator, or uh, lower slow production. Uh, we'll utilize our sim uh, refrigeration operational analysis table. We've been using something like this for decades. Uh, we're carrying it over to all of our current equipment. Why? Just because it works for us. All right, it works for us. It works really well for us. So. Uh, if you've never filled out one of these before and you get the opportunity in the future, uh, I'll tell you two things to stick to. And if you stick to these two things, this chart will never steer you wrong. Um, number one, don't skip any steps. The customer calls you up and said the machine just doesn't keep up like it used to. Uh, if we take them at our word, we're going to end up in a lot of trouble. As a technician, we need to verify to see if that's really true. So the first thing we'll do is an ice production check. We'll time a free cycle, time a harvest cycle, catch one batch of ice, weigh it out, do some pretty simple math to see how much ice that machine is producing. If you come up within 10% of what that machine is capable of producing, stop. Stop filling out the chart. You can't fix it. It's not broken. All right, the machine's doing its best. Unfortunately, from time to time, customers will buy their ice equipment based upon their current budget, not necessarily on their future needs. And if you try to troubleshoot a machine that uh, doesn't have a problem, that's working as, as good as it can, you're going to end up in a lot of trouble if you continue on. However, if you get done there and say, okay, yeah, this machine could be doing a lot better, then go ahead and keep going on, which brings us to number two. Number one, do not skip any steps. Number two, verify everything that this chart is asking you of. It's going to ask you to verify temperatures. It's going to ask you to look at other things to tell, and you're going to verify that information. Don't say, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's there. Verify it. So if you did not skip any steps and you verified all the information that that's asking of you, you're going to have some X's or check marks or smiley faces or whatever it is that you use to fill out this chart kind of scattered all over. You'll add up each one of these columns of how many marks you've got in it. And whichever number at the bottom is the highest is going to tell you this is the component you need to replace in order to fix your ice machine. And it works that easy. Uh, the other thing I will point out as well, we have developed one of those also for those units that have two refrigeration circuits. So uh, it'll be a single evaporator, two expansion valve. Uh, there's one of those available as well. So if you do have the Quiet Cube Technician's Handbook, you will have both 
of those operational analysis charts available to you. Symptom number three, remember, normal freeze cycle, long harvest cycle, but the backs of our cubes are not melted. Again, the key is nice sharp edges, good clean corners. The cube looks like it's in the same shape as the evaporator grid. If you say, yep, that's the problem, we've got a flow chart for that too. This is where it really changes up. This is a latent heat defrost. We can't really be grabbing too many things looking for temperatures. Latent heat is not a temperature we can feel, but we have developed a flow chart to keep you focused at the task at hand to see uh, and identify and correct the problem. So again, as you answer these questions, yes or no, is it this, is it this, is it this? Yes, no, yes, no. If you say yes, this is it. Uh, this is what you need to do to fix it. If you say no, it might continue on. But there will be a point where it's going to ask you to feel the liquid line as we go through uh, to see if that headmaster is doing his job. It's going to ask you to feel the liquid line coming into the receiver. Does it feel warm or hot? No? Okay, come back here. Does it feel warm or hot? No? How about here? If it, does this feel warm or hot? If you say yes at this one, uh-oh. That means our restriction is somewhere in that line set between the head and that head and pressure control valve. Also, uh, a quick note I'll point out as well, uh, do not ever deviate from our line sizes if you're installing these. And the reason why is if you looked at the, the BTUs and the production of this machine, and you're really good at refrigeration theory, if you were installing a quiet cube ice machine, you would say, you know what, this liquid line is way bigger than it should be for this uh, machine. And that would actually be a, a correct statement if all we had to do was make ice. Because the liquid line is sized for this part of our harvest cycle. This bypass adding whatever temperature we can to warm up the receiver. It's oversized for that reason. And so that's why we cannot deviate from our line sizes. It would create a restriction within it that it wouldn't be able to harvest. So just a, a little helpful, friendly note there. Uh, if you do think you're going to try to deviate. Symptom four, normal freeze, long harvest. The backs of our cubes are not or are melted out. Yeah, OK, this slide has a picture of a pretty extreme example. Uh, but again, the key is nice sharp edges, good clean corners. Maybe they're just a little bit jagged here. Maybe they're a little bit rounded out. We're melting it out. The good news is, is if you have this symptom, this is not a refrigeration problem. This is a release problem. Something is holding on to that sheet of ice way too long. Maybe that machine is due for a really good cleaning. Maybe we have some damage to the evaporator grid or the plastics around it. Uh, but also maybe, just maybe, uh, the one thing that we forget to think about and, and it really started showing up with the Indigo and Indigo Next machines with our acoustical probes was the fact that gravity plays part in our harvest cycle. We never really taught much about it in the past, but gravity's always been part of it. So if you do see some hollow cubes, uh, maybe we're melting out a little bit due to the fact that maybe that slab is not heavy enough for gravity to play its part. So maybe take that a, a minute and time the free cycle compared to in your technician's handbook to how long it's supposed to be in freeze cycle. If the machine is supposed to be in freeze for 11 minutes but keeps going in to harvest at 9 and you're melting out your cubes, this might be just a simple ice probe adjustment. Just make that ice just a little thicker so that we can have the, the weight so that gravity can play its part in the harvest cycle so it can release. Now again, when we talk about evaporator damage, we don't just mean the metal grid. We also mean the plastics around it. Is there any cracks? Are the plastics loose? Does the gasket stick out? Anything along those lines. If we have damage to the plastics, water's getting in through those cracks or those loose ports, and it's freezing behind the evaporator. So as we go into the harvest cycle, all that water that froze behind the evaporator has to melt before the ice on the front can release. So that would also be considered evaporator damage. The good news is, if you do have that kind of a situation, a lot of these uh, top and bottom and even some of these side frames are available as a replacement part. You don't have to replace that expensive entire evaporator grid uh, just uh, to get rid of a, a broken plastic extrusion. Uh, a lot of those are available. So check with your local distributor and see if those plastic parts 
uh, are available to be replaced. You don't have to replace the entire uh, evaporator grid, especially on machines that are out of warranty and are a little bit older. You save your customer a lot of money and yourself a lot of time because it's a lot easier to replace a plastic part of the evaporator uh, than it is to recover all the refrigerant and replace that entire evaporator assembly if you're just needing it for the plastics that are damaged. So that's how we uh, troubleshoot by symptom. That's our symptom troubleshooting. Uh, and hopefully a lot of you, if you are attending as a service technician, are utilizing these tools that we put together to try again to help you keep focused while you're in front of that piece of equipment while all that other distracting stuff is going on. All right, so we've been through the sequence of operation briefly. We also went through how we're going to utilize the refrigeration system in the Quiet Cube ice machine, uh, not only in the freeze cycle, but also in the harvest cycle. We went through the troubleshooting tips. Uh, I'm sorry, the troubleshooting symptoms, uh, the four symptoms of troubleshooting that we've been using for quite some time. So hopefully that kind of stuff will be able to allow you the ability to stay focused in front of the machine. Real quick, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to talk a, a little bit of the service training update. On the service training update, uh, again, next month, we'll be going through the sequence of operation uh, a lot more in depth. We're going to slow it down, tell you what the machine is doing, when it's supposed to be doing it, and covering that sequence of operation for Indigo Next. There's still a little bit of confusion about it. Uh, but it's really not as confusing as it needs to be. So we'll go through step-by-step step detailed uh, on how the sequence of operation on the Indigo Next machine occurs. Also, if you want to uh, learn more about any of our other equipment as far as service, whether the sequence of operation, uh, how to troubleshoot, maybe even preventative maintenance, cleaning, uh, things like that. We have a lot of different online self-taught uh, self training presentations and um, uh, programs that you can go in there and, and take it at your own pa uh, pace and, and learn more about these machines. Because the more you know about the machines, how they work, the easier it is for you to identify when the machine's not doing something it should should be doing or when it's supposed to be doing it. So all of our, we've got Flake and Nugget ones, Indigo Next, Quiet Cube, Air Water Remote. We've even got some of our older machines out there and available for training because there's still a lot of that older equipment available. We'll continue with our um, webcasts. Uh, again, next month's webcast will be on the sequence of operation for Indigo Next. And we started putting the recordings of the webcast out there on the website. So. Uh, maybe you want to go and, and, and look at it again, uh, see if I made a mistake and, and get that recording and you can give me a hard time next time you see me because I made a mistake or said something wrong during this webcast. Uh, so those are available to you as well. Uh, also, we wanted to point out that we have started developing more videos. We want to start building up a more of a video library uh, on how to uh, how to work uh, on the Indigo Next. Maybe troubleshooting or how to set some end user features, uh, cleaning, uh, all that kind of stuff. Because uh, a lot of times uh, service technicians find it a lot more beneficial to just go watch a short video real quick to get the gist of it so that they can get in there uh, and do that. So we'll continue to work on these videos as, as, they, uh, as uh, our, our resources allow uh, and keep posting those as they become available. We are very happy to announce that uh, beginning next year, 2022, we are going to be opening back up our in-person training uh, here at the Manitowoc Factory School. Uh, we've had a lot of service technicians ask us, hey, when are you going to start the factory schools up? Well, you know, I'd really like to get up there. My boss is, is on board. He wants to send me. So beginning February, the week of February 21st, 2022 will be our first factory school. Uh, and so we've only got six scheduled right now, but uh, we're, we're kind of liquid there. If uh, we're not sure exactly how many people are going to travel uh, during COVID, it looks like things are starting to settle down, but who knows what's going to happen next. So uh, we do have the ability to add additional schools if they start to, to fill up too much and, uh, and have the ability to add new weeks if these fill up. So we're looking forward to uh, having technicians back in our factory for our training, hands-on training, classroom training. It's a four and a half day seminar 
uh, and there's a lot of in-depth troubleshooting and beneficial information in the factory school. So we're really, really happy to announce that we will be going back to in-person factory school training beginning February of 22. All right, this brings us to the end of our webcast. I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. It's, it's been my pleasure presenting for you. At this point, you're seeing a QR code on your screen. Will's also put into the chat bar on the uh, in your in your um, question and answer area a link. If you're at your computer, we're going to go ahead and invite you to take our short quiz. Again, there's no right or wrong. You can miss them all. Wrong, uh, all the questions, that's fine. But um, go through answer the questions, tell us how we're doing. Uh, you even have the ability to offer suggestions if, if you'd like to see uh, some suggestions or future uh, webcasts. Uh, there's a place to put comments in these quizzes as well. So feel free to, uh, to share your comments, give us your email address, hit submit and send. And as a reward for taking the quiz, you will not only get a, uh, a virtual uh, webcast training certificate, but we'll go ahead and send you a PDF of today's presentation so that you can go back and refer to it in the event that uh, you wanted to recover some of the stuff that maybe we covered. So again, it's been my pleasure to be your host today. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. Thank you to Will York for being behind the scenes and driving this program. Uh, we want to wish everybody the best of, of health and, and just have a great day. And uh, we'll see you next time.